church, Joshua 14, verse 12, in the New International Version, this is what it says. Now give me this hill country that the Lord promised me that day. You yourself heard then that the Anakites were there and their cities were large and fortified. Somebody shout fortified. But the Lord helping me, I will drive them out just as he said. Uh, Let let me read a snippet of the old school version. Uh, Growing up in my grandmother's church, they would read the King James Version. It says, now, therefore, give me this mountain. Really quickly in the comment section and even in the room, I want you to repeat after me. I am called to climb. You may be seated. I am called to climb. If I could tag this text for just a few moments, I would use that topic. Called to climb. Called to climb. This this text brings to mind to me a conversation that creates somewhat of a counter-cultural critique. Because normally when we encounter mountains in our lives, our regular reaction is to ask God to move it. Did you hear what I just said? Now, this is legitimate scriptural strategy that Jesus teaches in Mark 11 and in Matthew 17. You remember, he said, if you speak to a mountain, you can tell it to be cast into the into the sea. If you speak to a mountain, you can tell it to move. Yes, this is scriptural strategy, but while it is one of the ways God can move, might I suggest to you it's not the only way that God can move. I'm excited because we do serve a God who can move mountains. I know what it feels like to have a mountain of debt that I don't know how to pay. And when I pray and trusted God some kind of way, he moved the mountain. I know what it feels like to be dealing with a mountain of depression and doubt and fear and not know what I'm going to do. But somehow, some way, God moved the mountain. I know what it feels like to deal with relational mountains and financial mountains, even health Mountains where I didn't know what I was going to do, but God made a way somehow, some way. But just because God can move mountains, that does not mean that he will move the mountain, uh uh-oh, or that he should move the mountain. Now, this is not a question of his capability, but rather of suitability. I'm getting ready to teach you something. This is not a question of God's capability, but rather it's a question of suitability. Because moving your mountain is not the only suitable strategy for your success. Jesus Christ, I don't think y'all are hearing me. Moving your mountain is not the only suitable strategy for God to bring you success. Here's our big idea, or rather our big question, and I pray y'all can feel me. Is it possible that you're asking God to move the same thing that he's called you to climb? I'm going to say that again. Is it possible that you are asking God to move the very same thing that he has called you to climb? Somebody shout climb. No, say it like you mean it. Shout climb. Put that word in the comment section. Why? Because I believe that we have been called to climb. Pastor Mike made it simple last week when he broke down the vision for the next three years of our church. Simply, here's our working word that we want to frame everything we do around, and that's climb. And many of us are misdiagnosing our mountains. Why? Because we keep asking God to move what he's called us to climb. You keep wait. You you're looking at the mountain, and you're trying to figure out why, with all the faith and all the calling and all the anointing that you have, why is that mountain still there? Is it possible that you've been waiting on God to move it, and He's waiting on you to climb it? Can I talk to about 1,500 mountain climbers who are in the chat right now? And you can just tag somebody and say, "I know God has called me to climb." 
Some of you have been climbing your whole life. You, you weren't born with a silver spoon in your mouth. You, you weren't born on the right side of the mountain. You didn't always go to the best schools and, and have the best coaches or the best, uh, the best teachers or even the best tutors. Some of us had to figure it out the hard way. We had to climb. Yeah. We had to climb. And, and I want to suggest to some of us that if we're not careful, we will spend our life waiting on God to move a mountain that he's already called us to climb. Here's what I've learned is that when God moves a mountain, his power works for you. Uh Oh, y'all ready for this? <laughs> when when God moves a mountain, his power works for you. All right. But when you climb a mountain, his power works through you. Jesus Christ, when he moves it, he's working for you. But when you climb it, he is working through you. And I need you to understand that God does not simply want to work for you, but he also wants to work through you. This is why he's called you to be the first person in your family to do certain things because he wants to work through you. This is why other people were able to get away with things that you weren't able to get away with because God didn't just want to work for you. He also wanted to work through you. This is why sometimes God can trust you with difficult moments and difficult situations because he's got to work for them. But the way your faith is set up, he can work through you. Can somebody shout, do it through me, Lord? God won't just give a blessing to you. No, sometimes he wants to get a blessing through you. Some of you are not going to need a miracle. God is calling you to be a miracle. God is calling and setting you up so that his power can work through you. When God moves the mountain, his power works for you. But when we climb a mountain, he's positioning us for his power to work through us. And a part of church in a while is realizing that not only does God desire to work for you, but he also desires to work through you. Somebody shout through. All right. There's a theological construct that we refer to as the doctrine of vocation. I want you to put that in your notes. Somebody put that in the chat. The doctrine of vocation. Martin Luther, not Martin Luther, the king, (laughs) Uh, not, not, not the king, but Martin Luther, the reformer. A century, he lived centuries before Martin Luther King Jr. In fact, Martin Luther King, who was born Michael King, uh, Michael King Jr., his father, Michael King Sr., uh, ran into some of the work of Martin Luther the Reformer and renamed himself and subsequently his son from Michael to Martin. All right. Martin Luther the reformer uh, led the reformation, right? Where the Protestant church comes out of, breaks away from the Catholic church. He comes up with what we refer to as the doctrine of vocation. I don't have enough time to break this down. I'll give you a simple definition. It simply suggests that God is at work in your work. Mm, that's good. Ah, this is good. It simply suggests that God is at work in your work. Yeah. All right, slide your feet back. Please don't log off the stream. Don't get mad at me when I say this, all right? God is at work, what? In your work. God is at work, what? In our work. Many of us are missing out on meaningful ministry because we're waiting on a microphone. I don't think y'all caught that. So many of us are missing out on ministry because we're waiting on somebody to hand us a microphone. And we think that we need a stage in order to make a difference when there are so many people who are making a difference, but you may never see them on a stage. Why? Because I don't need a microphone in order to do ministry. Can, can, Can I be honest? One of the things that I beat myself up about to this day, I remember in college, there was this young man uh, that I was with every day, man. We played basketball together. We were eating the calf together. <laughs> Y'all know about the calf. We were eating the calf together, man. We took classes together. And for three or four years, we're on campus together almost every day. And I never asked him if he knew Jesus. Now, I'm, I'm, I'm the young preacher on campus, and <laughs> everybody knows me and knows I'm in ministry. And we did everything else together, but I never stopped to witness to him. I remember a few years back, I'm, I'm, I'm waking up on a Saturday morning, I get a call from one of our classmates that he's passed away. And the first thing I thought to myself is, all the time I spent with him, I never took a moment to do ministry. Why? Because I was so convinced at 19, 20 years old that in order to do ministry, I had to have a microphone. 
when God had planted someone right next to me who needed ministry. Can, can, can I grab you real quick? Can I tell you why church in the wild is so important? Because what we're literally saying is, is, is that there are some people who may not ever come to the church. So the church has to find a way to go to them. Might I suggest to you that while you're so busy complaining about some of the people that are around you, is it possible that God has planted you around them? So as a result of them being close to you, they can get close to him. Jesus, is it possible that the same thing you're complaining about is the very thing that God is calling you to change? But so many of us are missing out on ministry because we're waiting on a microphone. Stop saying stuff like, I hate my job. <laughs> I hate my job. I, I just stepped all over your toes. You, you, don't log off. Don't, don't log off. I hate my job, right? But can I tell you something? There is purpose in your job. Mm, uh oh, there is purpose in your job, right? That, 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 that maybe e e even if you're not yet working the job that you feel is your purpose, there is still purpose in your job. That maybe you're sitting at that bank all day and you're complaining about that job because you don't want to be in the bank and you don't want to be doing this and you don't want to be doing, hey, I know I'm, I'm an entrepreneur and I'm supposed to be doing this, but maybe there's a lady that's going to walk into the bank on the brink of suicide and she's going to meet you and your smile and your demeanor and your love and your kindness and she's going to be able to sense the favor and love of God radiating off of you and you're going to be able to speak a word. Maybe God is going to use your prophetic gift in the middle of your workplace to show you something that outside of him you would never be able to know but you're so busy complaining about your job that you're missing the fact that God planted you there in purpose. Can I talk to a school teacher? Pastor Mike taught us about the mountain of education that maybe you're dealing with students who are coming from a less than stellar background. And here you are complaining about how bad these kids are. And, oh, man, they're stressing me out. And I wish these parents would do more. Maybe these parents are doing the best they can. But maybe God planted you in that school so that you could be the one voice who can look at a young man and say, although all of them are going left, you can still go right. Although everybody else is doing the wrong thing, I want to challenge you to do the right thing. Stop complaining about your job and realize that maybe God planted you there because there's purpose in your job. Uh-oh, not only is there purpose in your job, but there's also purpose at your job. <laughs> there's also purpose at your job. Th th this is so good. Uh, I, I remember before I came into full-time ministry, I, I was working at a bank, all right? And, and, and working at this bank, I'm like, man, I know I'm supposed to be in full-time ministry. I know I want to be in full-time ministry. And I remember hearing God tell me, right, that... I can't trust you to lead a church until you start leading your cubicle. That there's ministry opportunities all around your cubicle, but you're so busy looking for the church that you're overlooking the cubicle. Jesus Christ, you're so busy looking for this huge opportunity when everybody's going to know your name and everybody's going to put you on a flyer and you're missing the fact that no, there is purpose not only in your job, but there's also purpose at your job. Maybe, maybe God's planted you at your job because there's purpose there. You were hired, you were planted. Can I say that again? You weren't hired. You were planted. God planted you there on purpose for a purpose. Somebody shout climb. No, say it like you mean it. Shout climb. And before we can talk about mountain climbing, we first got to talk about mountain calling. Mm. Before we can talk about mountain climbing, that was all right. Before we can talk about mountain climbing, we first got to talk about Mounting calling. Uh-oh, 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 uh-oh. Can I go here? Can I go here? All right. Because if we're not careful, many of us are going to be climbing mountains that we were never called to. I'm talking to somebody. You don't want to hear this, but I'm going to say it again. If you're not careful, we'll start climbing mountains we were never called to. And look at you frustrated. 
because you're watching everybody else climb a mountain and you're trying to figure out as gifted as you are and as anointed as you are and as good looking as you are and as connected as you are, why you're struggling to get up the mountain like them. And maybe God is trying to get you to realize that you're so busy trying to climb the mountain that you picked instead of the mountain that I promised you. Jesus Christ, you're picking the mountain that you desire, not the mountain I designed. And it's always harder to climb your mountain than it is to climb his. Y'all not hearing me. It's always harder to climb your mountain than it is to climb his. All right. This is why we've got to discover our calling, but then also develop the discipline and discernment needed to recognize our mountain. Because one thing that's going to mess a lot of us up, and I pray y'all can receive this, is comparing our mountain to theirs. Hmm. Comparing the mountain that we want to the mountain God gave us. Comparing the mountain that, that, that when we were kids, we dreamed about. When maybe that's not the mountain that God has called you to. This is why things like P2P are so important. And I, I want to really sit in vision for a minute uh, and, and shout out to Pastor Darius and the entire team because we're kicking off Pathway to Purpose uh, in Mar the first Sunday of March. We're rebooting Pathway to Purpose. If you haven't taken that class already, I want you to do it. There's information right there on the screen. You can register and sign up to be a part of that because as a part of Pathway to Purpose, one of the things you do is you take a spiritual gifts assessment. And you take other assessments that help you recognize your calling and your gifting. Yeah. It helps you realize how God has wired you. See, one of the, I, this is not in my notes, but I want to give this to you anyway. One of the things we've got to stop doing is apologizing for the way God wired us. We've got to stop apologizing for the way God crafted and created us because he made you that way on purpose. Our job is to figure out how our wirings and our giftings coincide with our calling. Yeah. Even when we think about doulos and, and so many of the things that we're attempting to do, these are all designed for you to be able to recognize your call. What mountain has God called you to? Is it the mountain of family? Is it the mountain of education? Is it the mountain of government? Where has God called you to? Because ultimately our job as a church is not to feel a meeting place, but to fulfill a mission. Not just filled rooms, but fulfilled missions, right? The mission of our church is to love God, love people, and make a difference. I love this because I started tripping, thinking, doing some of the research, and I remember uh, Pastor Mike and myself and some of the other elders of our church, we were having this conversation around the words that were used throughout history uh, for church. That originally the word church was a Greek word, ekklesia. Right. Ecclesia. Ecclesia. It simply means a, a gathering of people um, who are on, on one accord for one purpose. Right. Uh, but, but somewhere along the way, we stopped using the word Ecclesia and we start using this German word Kirschy. All right. Kirschy simply means the meeting place. So what we did was unknowingly we exchanged the mission of the church for the meeting of the church. And so for years, we've been putting the meeting over the mission. But Church in a Wild says we're going to swap and put the mission over the meeting. The meeting is the place that we come get the information and inspiration that we need to go out and fulfill the mission. Church in the Wild says that no matter if you're in the sanctuary physically or digitally, once you log off or walk out, it's time for you to clock in to your purpose and your calling. This is so good because it is time for us to discover our calling. All right. Now, what I love about God is, is that God does give us specific callings, specific, right? He is very clear. He is very intentional in how he calls us. I think this is good because we are created for good works, not every work. Yeah. All right. We are created for good works, not every work. You can't do everything. You can't do everything, but you can do the thing that God has called you for. Calling simply means I'm favored for it. Uh-oh, we might have a little church right here. I, I, I need to be standing flat-footed and, and teaching and casting vision, but we might have a little church right here because when you realize that you, you're called, that simply means that you're favored 
for it. All right. I'm going to say that again because I don't think you caught this. God favors you for the mountain that he's called you to. All right. And some people are looking at you climb and don't realize when the wind started blowing, why were you able to keep climbing? That when it started raining and the rocks got slippery, how were you able to keep climbing? That when nobody would help you and nobody would support you, how were you able to keep climbing? Why? Because I was called to this mountain. And when I realized I was called to this mountain, I realized I was favored for this mountain. I don't know who I'm preaching to, but you can get all the degrees, you can get all the training, you can get all the teaching, but nothing beats the favor and the grace of God because when you're favored for something the devil can't stop you when you're favored for something even when you want to quit you keep going and you keep fighting and you keep climbing why because I'm called I'm called to this somebody shout I'm called to it I'm called to be a good mother. I'm called to be a good father. I'm called to break generational curses in my family. Yes, I get tired of teaching sometimes, but you know what? I'm called to make a difference in those children's lives. I get tired of spending all day at the studio taking pictures and editing videos, but I'm called to present God in a creative light. Can I find somebody who's called to it? And when you're called to it, you realize you're favored for it. Jesus Christ, when you're called to it, you realize that you're favored for it. Look what the Bible says in Joshua chapter 14, verse 6. I got to hurry. Now, the people of Judah approached Joshua at Gilgal and Caleb, son of Jephunneh, the Kezanite, and said to him, you know what the Lord said to Moses, the man of God at Kadesh Barnea about you and me. Let's skip down to verse 9. So on that day, Moses swore to me, The land on which your feet have walked will be your inheritance and that of your children forever because you have followed the Lord my God wholeheartedly. I got to give you some context of what's going on here. Um, This is it's sort of us picking up 45 years later from the events in Numbers 13. In Numbers 13, Moses sends 12 spies to go look at the land, to go get a preview, to go, to, go, to go take a sneak peek at what this promised land looks like. You know, he sent out 12 spies, 10 came back with a negative report, but two came back with a positive report. Those two spies were Joshua and Caleb. Caleb comes back with a positive report, and though everybody else is saying they can't do it, he says, no, we certainly can do it. 45 years later, he shows up while everybody else is getting their part of the promised land. Joshua is dividing the promised land to all of the tribes, right? And he's giving the Benjamites this tribe, and he's, he's giving uh, Ephraim this tribe. He, he, he's giving Judah, I'm sorry, uh, Judah this tribe. He's dividing all these different parcels of land to the 12 tribes, And so Caleb rolls up and says, hey, don't forget about the mountain I've been called to. While you're giving out every while you're giving out land to everybody else, don't forget this is my mountain. He was reminding Joshua that God had already called him to a mountain. Right now, here's what blesses me about this. It's been 45 years since he's been here. It's been 45 years since this this land was promised to him, right? And so for 45 years, something keeps him focused on what God called him to. Jesus. 45 years of living, 45 years of of working, 45 years of of trying to figure it out and trying to get it done. and, and, And even though he's watched everybody else get their stuff, he's so focused on his calling that at no point does he get envious of what God gave somebody else. Jesus Christ. He is so focused on what God called him to that he can congratulate you without desiring what you got. This is going to get a lot of us in trouble because we don't know how to root for somebody else without becoming envious. We don't know how to sit at the bottom of their mountain and clap for them while they climb but keep in the back of our mind the mountain God called us to. He watches everybody else get theirs, 
but he somehow stays focused on where God has favored him. All right. All right. All right. right. I went to this store here in Birmingham uh, called REI. All right. It stands for Recreational Equipment Incorporated. All right. Uh, It's on Highway 280. It's called REI. And it's a it's an outdoorsman type store. And and they have this huge portion of it that's that's dedicated to mountain climbing. All right. So I knew I was getting ready to go into this series. We were talking about climbing in a while. So I walk in and I find a specialist. All right. I said, I just wonder if you got a few minutes. I want to ask you a couple questions. And he started talking to me about the different types of rock climbing. All right. The one that messed me up is called anchored climbing. Come on. Yeah. Anchored climbing. <laughs> a- a- Anchor climbing is when you stand at the bottom of the mountain you're getting ready to climb and you find a rope and an anchor, and you throw it toward the top of the mountain, right? You, you allow it to wedge itself into the rock, right? You tug on it a little bit. Let me make sure this, this is safe and secure. And then once you know that it's secure, then you begin. Jesus Christ. Then you begin to climb, Right? So now, no matter what is happening around you, you're able to keep climbing because you've got an an anchor. I don't know who I'm preaching to, but calling is our anchor. So I don't have time to desire what God is trying to do in your life because I'm anchored in what he's trying to do in my life. I'm so glad at what he's doing in your family, but I'm anchored in what he's trying to do in my family. I'm a root for what he's doing in your church, but I'm anchored in what he's doing in my church. I'm not going to get distracted in my giving. Why? Because I'm anchored. I'm not going to get distracted in my service. Why? Because I am anchored. Somebody shout anchor. No, you got to say it like you mean it. Shout anchor. See, when you've got an anchor, you don't get easily distracted by what's going on around you. Because I'm anchored. I don't know who I'm preaching to, but the next time the devil shows up in your life to distract you from the mountain that God has called you to climb, I just want you to shout back at the devil, I'm anchored. He says anchor climbing allows you to continue to climb up the mountain in, oh God, in less than favorable conditions. I got to sit here for a minute. See, when you're anchored in climbing, you're able to climb, watch this, because you're connected to something that's above you. Mm, Y'all are missing what I'm saying. When I'm anchor climbing, I'm able to continue to climb even when the conditions aren't favorable because I'm connected to something that's above me. I'm connected to a higher purpose. I'm connected to God. I'm connected through prayer. I'm connected through fasting. I'm connected through my man of God and through my church. And I'm able to keep climbing because I'm connected. Who do you need to disconnect from so you can keep climbing higher? Say amen, I say ouch when I teach you sort of the same thing. Who do you need to disconnect from so you can continue to climb? All right? Calling is our anchor. Somebody shout anchor. Anchor. All right? After mountain calling, we then see mountain claiming. Put that in your notes. Mountain claiming. Mountain claiming or rather claiming simply means I I have faith for it. Calling means I'm favored for it. Claiming is I have faith for it. Somebody shout faith. Faith. Caleb is is an amazing example of faith. I think that oftentimes when we teach faith in church, we overlook Caleb and and we run to, to Abraham. We run to the miracles and all of these are great instances and examples of faith. But Caleb, uh, in the verses that he's mentioned in the Bible, which is not a lot, but But throughout them, one of the common threads we see is the amazing amount of faith that he has. Radical belief in God, all right? Even when it's unpopular and or or unlikely. The Bible says in Numbers 13, 30, I, I told you about this earlier, then Caleb silenced the people before Moses and said, we should go up and take possession of the land for we can certainly 
do it. This is a statement of faith. All right? This is not just optimism. This is faith. This is not Caleb uh, practicing some some holy hoping for the best. (laughs) No, this is him anchoring himself in what God has said and what God has already done. He has faith for the mountain. This is so good, right? He's not saying, well, you know, it's giants over there, but I believe it'll work out. No, he's saying it's giants over there, but I believe God will work it out. Can I preach to somebody and tell you that if you're going to climb, you've got to develop the type of faith that says not only will it work out, but it will work out because God is working it out. I'm preaching to somebody. I know it's going to work out because I serve a God who's working it. I don't know who this is for or who needs to hear this, but I need to tell you that as you climb your mountain, you got to make sure that you have the type of faith that says, God will work this out. There's going to be obstacles and issues along the way, but faith says God will work it out. What this teaches us is, as we as we prepare for church in the wild is, is that not only do we need to develop faith in what God can do in us individually, but also faith in what God can do in us collectively. Church church in the wild isn't just God can do it for me, it's God can do it for us. I I don't think y'all hear what I said. Church in the wild isn't just God can do it for me, it's no God can do it for us. It's not just looking at what God can do in our lives individually, but it's unleashing the the corporate power that we have collectively. What in the world would the city of Birmingham and, 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 and this world and this country and this world look like if thousands of Rock City citizens start climbing at one time? Jesus Christ. What if I'm climbing my mountain of family and I look over there, I see you, girl climbing that government mountain. Look at you, Senator. I see you. I see you, city councilman. That's why I'm so glad that God has has blessed our church to have people of impact. When you you look at city councilmen and commissioners and and campaign managers and city councilmen and women who are all a part of our church, that suggests that God is positioning men and women who love him to climb the mountain. But you've got to have faith if you're going to climb the mountain, look at Joshua chapter 14, verse 9. I want to look at that last part. It says, because you have followed the Lord, my God, wholeheartedly. This is Caleb repeating to Joshua what Moses had promised him 45 years before. He says, no, I know this is my mountain. <laughs> it was promised to me, not because I was cute. But it was promised to me because I followed the Lord, my God, wholeheartedly. In other words, he stakes his claim by confessing his faith. Do I need to say that again? He stakes his claim by confessing his faith. So no, I know this is my mountain because I've been following God. I know I'm going to climb this mountain because I've been trusting God. I know my family is going to come out and go to another level because I've been following God. I know it's going to work out, not because I've been doing everything I can, but because I've been trusting God that it will work out. He stakes his claim by confessing his faith. And look at what the Bible says in verse 10. Now then, just as the Lord promised, he has kept me alive. For 45 years, since the time he said this to Moses, while Israel moved about in the wilderness. So here I am today, 85 years old. All right. Once we learn mountain claiming, we can finally start mountain climbing. (laughs) It starts with calling. Then it moves to claiming. And then finally, it's time to climb. See, be careful that you don't that you don't try to climb before you claim. You got to claim before you climb, right? And climbing simply means I'm willing to fight for it. Mm, 
Jesus Christ. And I, I, I want to I wanna, I wanna tell somebody that's watching right now that, that as you prepare to climb, <laughs> make sure you grab a weapon. <laughs> because climbing many times is synonymous with fighting. And the problem I have with the, with the 21st century church is, is that we want to climb, but we don't want to fight. Jesus Christ. Can you look at somebody and tell them you're going to have to fight for it? Look at somebody and say, you're going to have to fight for it. Put that in the comment section. You're going to have to fight for it. If you really want this the way you say that you want it, you need to get prepared because you're going to have to fight for it. How do I know this, right? How do I know this? Because the Bible says in Joshua chapter 14, verse 12, now give me this hill country that the Lord promised me that day. You yourself heard that the Anakites were there, right? The Anakites were a tribe of giants that possessed this part of the promised land, right? So what Caleb is saying is, is give me this mountain, even though I know I'm going to have to fight to get it from the people that's already got it. (laughs) Jesus Christ. Do you know the kind of faith you have to have to be willing to ask God for something that you know you're going to have to fight to keep? Because when I'm called, Jesus Christ, when I'm called, what I'm saying is, is, oh, I'm favored for this. We'll shout about that. Slap your neighbor and shout, I'm favored. Oh, I'm favored for this. Right? And then I move from calling to claiming. And claiming simply means I've got the faith for it. And we'll shout about that. Oh, I, I name it a claim. I went to the dealership and I walked around that car seven times and I decreed and declared by faith, this is my new car. You know, because the children of Israel, they walked around Jericho seven times and then, and then the walls came crashing down. But what you will ignore is, is that even after the wall came down, they still had to storm in. Jesus Christ. We want to talk about and shout about the favor <laughs> and the faith but then run from the fight. Pastor Mike taught me this. I'll never forget it. He said, who the kingdom, who God favors, the kingdom features, and the devil fights. Whoever God favors, the kingdom features, but the devil is going to fight. And we've been running to favor and feature, but running from frights. (laughs) We've been running to the feature because we got the favor, but run away from the fight. And what God needs is a generation of people who are willing to fight. Caleb is still willing to climb the mountain, even though he knows he'll have to fight for it. Because favor nor faith is an excuse not to fight. Jesus Christ, I got to go home. Can I tell you something with your favorite self? Look at you. Oh, favored and stuff. With your favorite self, you still aren't favored enough not to have to fight. If you're going to climb the mountain that God has called you to, if we're truly going to have, if we're truly going to go into the wild, we're going to have to fight. I love what the Bible says because the Bible says that the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. But they're mighty in God for the pulling down of strongholds, right? So that means that just because we're in the wild, we can't fight the way they fight in the wild. No, because the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. (laughs) They fight with their fists. We fight with our faith. We'll see them at war and they'll be in a tank, but we fight with our tithe. (laughs) We fight with our commitment. We fight by waking up every morning and getting on that devotional because we know there's a word that God is trying to plant in our spirit that is going to propel us throughout our day. We fight every time we look at our bills and still decide to give. Hmm. What I love about this is, is that we told you earlier that, that God is at work in our work. It's the doctrine of vocation. 
Can I tell you something? That God is always working when you work. Whenever you're working, God is working. This is why you got to keep fighting to give and, and fighting to stay committed and to, to stay committed and, and fighting to be a part of what God is doing in your church. Why? Because whenever you're working, God is working. So when you give to your church, <laughs> you're giving to your church so that God can then cause your church to turn around and give back to people. Yeah. Because when you give, he gives. When you serve other people in your church, right, we become the hands and feet of Jesus. We are then, when we are serving, God is serving. When you love on somebody, guess what? That's God loving on somebody. Because God is always at work in our work. I'm done here. But look what the Bible says in Joshua chapter 13 through 15. Let's look at 13 and 14, actually. Then Joshua blessed Caleb, son of Jephunneh, and gave him Hebron as his inheritance. So Hebron has belonged to Caleb, son of Jephunneh, the Kezite, ever since, because he followed the Lord, the God of Israel, wholeheartedly. I'm done here, but I think this is good. Because of Caleb's obedience, those that came after him received an inheritance. All right? Because Caleb obeyed, somebody else got blessed. Can I tell you, while you're in the wild, that somebody is counting on your climb? Somebody is counting on your climb. The Bible says that ever since then till now, that mountain has belonged to somebody that came from Caleb. Uh-oh, y'all know I'm setting you up, right? What this means is, is that as we climb, <laughs> as we climb up that mountain and we're climbing, that our ceiling becomes somebody else's floor. Help me, God. That our, our, our ceiling becomes somebody else's floor. That where we stop becomes where somebody else will start. That because Caleb was not afraid of his mountain, that now generations of his family were able to call that place home because yeah. he was willing to fight for it because he had the faith for it because he realized he was favorite for it. And can I tell you that there are people who are going to have your blood in their veins, who are going to have your last name, who you may never meet, but they're going to start wherever you stop. See, one of the reasons why you can't stop climbing is because even though you think it's just you climbing, it's really you and them. You can't afford to stop climbing the mountain of education and you can't stop climbing the mountain of, of, of government and, and media and entertainment. You can't stop climbing because you're not the only one. I don't know who I'm talking to, but you're carrying subsequent generations of your family. And they're counting on your climb. They're counting on you to keep climbing. Because when you climb, they climb. I told you I was in this, the store, REI. <laughs> and, and after we talked about anchor climbing, we talked about what they call lead rope climbing. Lead rope climbing. Lead rope climbing simply means that... Uh, a more experienced climber will begin to climb. And then after he's made a certain amount of progress, he'll take his rope and he'll throw it down so that a less experienced climber can then grab onto his rope and climb to the point in the rock where he stopped. He'll continue to climb. And then you know what that second person will do? 
they'll take their rope and they'll throw it down so that an even less experienced climber can pick up where they left off. And you look up and what started out as one person climbing a mountain, now all of a sudden, I got a whole family climbing a mountain. I got a whole community climbing a mountain. I got a whole church that's climbing a mountain. I don't know who I'm talking to, but I need you to realize that as you climb, we climb. That's why you can't stop because you're not the only one climbing. Your family's climbing with you and your children are climbing with you and your co-workers are climbing with you and your small group is climbing with you. That's why you can't get distracted by what somebody else is doing. You got to keep climbing. So, Father, now in Jesus' name, I speak by faith that you have called us to climb. God, I stand here as one of the spiritual elders and big brothers of this movement that we call Rock City in recognition of the fact that, God, you have called us to climb. We can't stay where we are. We can't stay stagnant. We can't stay stuck. Why? Because we got to climb. And Father, help us to realize that as we climb, there's somebody coming behind us who's going to climb too. Father, we lift up our man of God, Pastor Mike McClure Jr., Lady J, and their family. Because God, we believe that as our spiritual leaders, as the senior leaders of this house, they're lead climbing. That as you continue to, to lead them up the mountain and lead them up this rock, that, Lord God, we'll have the faith to follow them. God, keep us from any and all distractions that we won't have a spirit of, of competition or, or covetousness that will make us look at what somebody else is doing and neglect what you've called us to do. But instead, we'll keep climbing. We'll keep climbing. When the winds blow, we'll keep climbing. When the rains begin to fall, we'll keep climbing. That, God, even when we have to fight, We'll fight with one hand and we'll climb with the other. Father, we thank you for these things. We claim these things. We believe these things. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said amen. <laughs> Family, listen, if you're watching, if you're watching us right now, I'm telling you that you've been called to climb. Despite what your past may tell you, despite what mistakes you've made before, despite your own feelings of inadequacy, the devil loves to lie to us and tell us that we're not worth it, that God could never use us, that God hadn't called us. The devil is a liar. You've been called to climb. There's a mountain that maybe you've been asking God to move. Say, no, I can't move it because I called you to climb it. But can I tell you that <laughs> It's hard to climb when you're not anchored. So today you may be watching me and I want you to make your next move your best move. I want you to text HOME to 28950. If you're making a decision to give your life to Christ, text HOME to 28950.